Okay, so last time we talked about matching cubes, right? isosurfaces, isocontours. <clears throat> Two lectures ago we talked about slicing, and this is just some more examples. These are slices in a 3D volume, right, along a wing, right, studying the aerodynamics behind a wing or on top of a wing, and they're color coded. Right by some by some value, probably velocity of you know velocity of the wind. Right, and here are some more here, here two more slices color coded. Right, here's another slice. <clears throat> so today I'm going to wallop you with a lot of new terminology and some psychedelic data viz volume viz stuff. It's going to be, like, not the world's easiest lecture again. And it's going to require that you use your imagination to some extent. And, yeah, this is, this is assignment two, though. Like, all the concepts we're talking about in, in today are implemented in the software that you're using for assignment two. Right, and this is this is the theor part of the theoretical background for assignment two about volume visualization techniques, <clears throat> and it's not not a trivial topic. So, <clears throat> if anybody can remember, there was a slide that mentioned indirect volume visualization techniques and direct volume visualization techniques. It's not the world's most important slide, but we classify volume visualization into direct and indirect techniques. And what we what those terms mean are indirect uses interpolated values. So you inter did everybody notice that all the marching cubes triangles are interpolated between the original samples? And slice, when you take a slice through a 3D volume, those samples are usually interpolated, the actual color-coded samples. That's another way of phrasing that is indirect. You're looking at the, the data in an indirect way, like through the lens of a slice or through the lens of a surface, so to speak. We can also classify another group of methods as direct volume visualization, which means we are looking at the data values that are stored in the 3D space directly without necessarily an intermediate stage, right? Like an intermediate stage of producing triangles, for example. Slices are usually composed of triangles too, by the way. So it's like, it's, it's skipping that constructing new triangles phase, which is an indirect way of, of, of looking at the, of the data. So that's what this means, no intermediate representation, it's, the, it's really 3D. And this, this real 3D in quotes, again, slices are constricted to 2D planes, and surfaces, if anybody can remember, we kind of, we describe them as 2.5D. That's because they are surfaces uh, that are inside a volume and they're infinitely thin. They have no thickness. So you can't, it's not a good idea to use the word volumetric really to describe a surface if it's infinitely thin. If it had thickness, then, then yeah, then it would be much a, a better term. Okay, so let's begin with the terminology. So the first term that we're going to introduce is called ray casting. And these are some pictures and some, some words to describe this concept. The value of each pixel in the image is determined by sending a ray through the pixel into the scene. Now, the, the value of each pixel, by the way, that, that means the color, the value of each pixel, is determined by casting a ray through the pixel into the scene and then sampling the 3D data. And remember, we call this, from the 
two lectures ago, an image order technique, that was one of the terms we introduced two lectures ago. Image order versus object order. Which means there's a for loop that traverses the image pixel by pixel. And in this case, it's for each pixel, cast array from that pixel into the volume, sample the, the data along the ray, and then map those that sampled data to color and the opacity in this case. And we call that ray casting. Now that's one picture of three rays being cast into the volume. This is the volume data. The observer is on the left behind the display. This is like your display space. And the observer is on the other side here. <clears throat> Here's another view of that same idea. By the way, I, I interchangeably use these terms image plane and image space. They mean the, the screen, the, the 2D image that is the result, the graphic that is result, results in the, after the, the ray tracing. Is it casting another word, tracing? Is ray tracing the casting same? Brought your psychic powers today, didn't you, Rodri? So, Rodri asked a very good question again. <laughs> what about ray tracing? Is this the same as ray tracing? I will answer that, but not on this slide. There's a slide dedicated to that. There's even a YouTube video dedicated just to that question. Just to that question. Ray casting. So, Ray tracing, where did you learn about ray tracing? In graphics. So graphics, in your graphics class, you talk about a lot, a lot about ray tracing. And here we're going to talk about ray casting. There is a difference, there are some differences, and there are some similarities too. Let's look at this image. Here, I've, there's one ray at starting at this pixel, cast into the volume data, and then look, there's this thing called an intensity profile above. And the intensity profile is a, is a depth versus scalar intensity or scalar magnitude on that y-axis. So along the depth axis is, is the position of the ray as it goes from the front to the back. And on the y-axis is the scalar value that the ray encounters as it traverses the volume from front to back. So the ray is actually the data sampling technique. We are sampling the volume data at regular spatial intervals as we go from front to back. So here, the ray hits. What's the first thing the ray hits in, the, in this volume, in this picture? The bounding box, and then the second thing? Is the surface really the second thing? What do, you, do you see anything here? Do you see the object inside here? What do you see? That's right, there's a head inside this volume, right? There's the, there's the ray traced, ray casted image of the head. But there's something between the bounding box and the, the head, right? Isn't there something in between? Yeah, air, oh, air. So in this case, you can imagine density, this being a volumetric data of, of density. So air has a low, relatively low density. Right, so the first thing the ray hits is air, and, it, and it, it samples the air, which has a low density. So the profile is, is, consists of low density values in the beginning, before it reaches the head. And then as soon as it reaches the skin, there's a sharp gradient, or a sharp increase when it hits the skin, it, it hits the bone, 
right? Then it hits soft tissue, like blood, and then it hits more bone, and so on. I don't, I don't know the rest. <laughs> but yeah, I think hopefully you get the idea. So this is a 2D plot of depth versus scalar magnitude along this ray. That's what that image is. And that's, that's, the, that's the essence of ray casting in one slide. Right? There are more details, but that's the essence. No, no, there's not always a one-to-one -one correspondence between this volume and the image. So the, you imagine zooming in, you could zoom in on the volume to expand it, and you can also zoom out. But I think your psychic powers are causing you to ask that question, because that is, that is a kind of... There are consequences for that. There are consequences, and we actually have slides that talk about that exact topic. I don't think we talk about that too much in this lecture, but there is one lecture where we do talk about that quite a bit. But like one of the, as a preview, one of the consequences is, as you zoom in, imagine you, you have a, a camera and you want to zoom in on just the nose, for example. The nose is mapped in this image space. That means your sampling, your sampling rate has gone down. Your sampling rate in image space is the same because it's always pixel by pixel. But in 3D space, the sampling rate has gone down because the space between data samples has increased a lot. When you zoom in, the space between data samples increases quite a bit. So, so multiple pixels could be mapped to the same. Exactly, exactly. And you could see artifacts, artifacts if you when you zoom in too much. Anybody know what those artifacts are called? That would be that would be an exciting. Uh, it's not a bad guess. I would call them aliasing artifacts. That's the undersampling. Undersampling. So you'll start to see edges that that don't really exist. Okay, so. This next slide is a focus on this generating an intensity profile. Oops. So this is a graph. It, there's depth on this axis into the volume. And then it's the same, the same y-axis, scalar value, or scalar value magnitude, or whatever you want to call it. Now this curve is the same represents the same intensity profiles on the previous slide. So you're casting a ray into a volume, and you're sampling the values that that ray encounters in the volume data along the ray. And it's picking up different values depending on which how deep it's gone into the volume and what depth it is. Now, we want to actually we actually want to focus on special parts of the 3D volume. Right? We don't want to just project every data sample back on the image plane. If we project every single data sample onto the image plane, the only thing we'll see is a, like a, a box of, of like data that we can't understand. So these are different ways of deciding what information should actually be projected back to image space. Right? We don't want to project everything back to image space. We just want to project a subset of the volume back to image space. Or we want to sample a subset of the volume and, and project that back. I all, Every year I think I, I need a slide that shows what happens when you just project all the data onto the image plane because you can't see inside. Right, they, those images do exist. Right, 
you can't see anything inside. You just see the outer edges of the box, like the other sides of the box. And that's it. And it's not very interesting, because what you're interested in is inside. But I, I never made that slide. <laughs> so this is our intensity profile that's generated as, as we cast the ray into the volume. And we can return different information depending on what we're interested in. And that is called a ray function. We have different kinds of ray functions. One is called maximum intensity projection. That means when we cast a ray into the volume, and we sample all the data, we always return the highest value we encountered along the way. Which in this picture is here. Right? That's the highest value we encountered. So it returns that value. It turns it into a color and an opacity on the image, on the image plane. Another kind is compositing, and that is just adding up all the data samples. So here we hit a data sample, hit another data sample, hit another data sample, and so on. And we just add up the samples as we hit them, as we traverse the, the volume. X-ray, an X-ray ray function is like averaging. Right? Basically, it looks like it's computed using an average, and it looks literally like an x-ray. We're going to see some images of that. So add up all the values you, you hit, and then multiply them by the number of values. And then another one is called first hit. So cast array into the volume and return the very first value that we hit, so to speak. The first value that the, the ray hits. Right. So we're going to see, we're going to show examples of these, what the, the effects, the consequences of these different ray functions and what they return from the volume data. So imagine we use ray casting and combined with a first hit ray function. So in that case, it was like what Rodri was saying, the first thing, the first object that the ray hits is the skin. So whenever we cast a ray into the volume, with a cadaver's head, <laughs> the first thing that we hit is the skin. Exactly, you, you have to add a threshold to leave out the air, exactly. And you end up getting something that resembles an isosurface. Right. It looks just like an isosurface, doesn't it? Here's, here's the ray function that takes an average. Right, so it just adds up all the, the values and that, and that takes an average of them. And this, anybody know what that image is? It's the hand. It's a hand. Yeah, that's right. So that's like the wrist bones. It's a hand, and it looks like an X-ray. Here's an example of maximum intensity projection. So, anybody know what this this uh, is? So that's it, returning the highest intensity value in the data set at every pixel. And then we have compositing combined with semi-transparency. And this helps us to see more objects. Right? We get to see more, more objects with the x-ray. In the compositing, we get to see more things. With the first hit and in the maximum intensity, that's that focuses on a single kind of object. Right here, we can see multiple objects. In this case, it's a heart. It looks like a heart to me. 
and some surrounding soft tissue. Right, and here are some more examples. Right, that's the example from the previous slide. Here's a here's. Now look, we can actually generate surfaces. So this is an alternative way of of rendering surfaces. But now the surfaces can have some depth, right? They're not just infinitely thin triangles anymore. We haven't talked about it in detail, the actual sampling of the volume. But you can hopefully see from the images that we're no longer talking about infinitely thin surfaces, but objects with some thickness, right? And so on. <clears throat> yeah. So, does an actual X-ray machine when they develop pictures? Is it like a weighted average X-ray thing? The actual X-ray machine? Yeah. I don't know the answer to that. I don't think it's a weighted. I don't think it's the equivalent of a weighted average. I don't think so. But I I don't know the consequences of photons interacting with with bone tissue. Uh, bone matter. I don't, I don't know the details. And this is mysterious. This It's okay if this is still very mysterious. Like some of you are thinking, oh, this is really strange and mysterious. And that's fine. It's because I have, we still haven't finished the explanation of what this is, how it works, and, and the consequences and so on. It's, we're starting and we, we've introduced a few terms, but there are still terms remaining, right? Rodri still has questions about the ray tracing, and, and Carlo has questions about the zooming, and we are going to get to those things. But, by the way, we have already seen this in action in the video that we showed in the lecture called Introduction to scientific and volume visualization, so I sh we showed a video there, and all of that was done using ray casting. So you have actually seen it before, but I didn't use the terms ray casting. I didn't use that term during that lecture. Here's another term called classification. Who took the computer vision class. There's a computer vision class, right, at Swansea University. Anybody take that? Yeah? Anybody's too afraid to admit they took... <laughs> I might ask you to recall something. Do, do, do you remember the term classification being used in your computer vision class? Yeah, do you remember what was being said or any, any idea what was being said there? Something Exactly, yes, that's right, that's right. You passed the test. <laughs> What's your name, by the way? Uh, Tom. Tom. You did well, Tom. I forgot to pass this one. So, classification is what Tom said. It's t examining every single data value. In any, in, in the vision sense, it was 2D slices. Here it's in the 3D volume. And then assigning it some object property, like all values between, in this range, mean that this data value corresponds to bone. And all data values in this range mean that this data value corresponds to air. So it's assigning ranges of data values to specific objects or semantic, semantic, to give them semantic meaning and not just numbers. So that's called classification. Now as soon as you try to write a computer program that does that, it's called segmentation. So that's a huge, huge topic. Like. Here's, here's a 2D slice of data or a 3D volume. Please automatically classify every data sample into some object. Like, tell me if this is bone, tell me if this is soft tissue, if this is air, if it's something else, 
gray matter, and all the different objects you can imagine. Yes, it is very closely related to margin cubes and margin squares. In margin cubes and margin squares, you're, you're making a binary decision. Is this above a threshold or below a threshold? And you're not necessarily assigning it to a, a meaning a meaning though. You're not saying, okay, everything above this value is bone and everything below this value is air or something like that. But there's there's a similar decision being being made. This is more like clustering, yes. Yes, exactly, exactly. And it's a very big research topic. Like lots of people study how to do this automatically, you know, for 30 years now, or maybe longer, 40 years. It's thousands of people, right? So I'm just have this one slide that mentions what this form is. But if you take computer vision, then you'll hear lots, lots more about this. And medical image analysis, you'll hear like, well, you, you know, a whole, you can take a whole module just on this topic. So, but I just mentioned that so you know what that term means for future slides. Right. We're all, we're, we're basically, we're building up the background of terminology before we get to sort of the classic ray casting algorithm. Right. We need some background knowledge. So, another term. I told you I was going to spam you with terminology today. Transfer function. I did look up, I have some books, and I do look up terms in books. That's where I usually get my terminology. But in this instance, I didn't find a very good definition in the books I have. So I created a definition. A transfer function is an operation that maps scalar values in 3D to color, opacity, and or texture values. Now, maybe you see that and you're reminded of something. I, it would be nice if, if it did remind you of something. Imagine I covered up part of the definition. Scalar values, I changed the 3D to 2D, and then I just covered up opacity and texture. It said, an operation that maps scalar values in 2D is color. Does that sound familiar? The Viz pipeline. What what would you call that? If if I said what, you know, name the term. An, an operation that maps scalar values in two D to color. Period. What would you call that? That's a valid database test question. Audrey. <laughs> it's a color map. It's called a color map. I was going to say map. Yeah. So you, you guys uh, know what color mapping is now, right? You take a scalar value and you assign it to a color. Right? That was part of assignment one. Right? You had to do lots of color mapping. Right? You use color. This is an extension of color mapping conceptually. But now we're extending it to, to 3D space and we're including opacity in there. So we're assigning the data samples to color and opacity, not just color, so to speak. And we're extending the, the dimensionality to 3D rather than just 2D. So we're going to be using the term transfer function in the upcoming lectures. And here's a, here's a slide that illustrates a, a transfer function so on the bottom axis is color, and so there's a color map here, and there's the, 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 the x-axis is also indicating the data of the scalar value. So this is the part you've seen already, taking a data value and mapping it to color. You've seen that already, that's the color map. Now what we're doing is we're adding a, a, a dimension 
along the y-axis is the data value again, but it's also mapped to opacity. So it's a two-dimensional mapping space now instead of a one-dimensional mapping space. So if I look at the density of this, of this data again, the low density is air, right? And then the density increases as we, as we move up the data values. So air is mapped to the color black in this transfer function. Skin is mapped to the color yellow. Red is mapped to the bones, right? The, the density values are increasing. There's one more there that's not on the color legend. Anybody notice another one? Blue mapped to what? The teeth, yeah. But there's another mapping going on, and that's opacity. So that's in this direction. Again, the data value is on the y-axis. So air has zero opacity. That's the same thing as air is being is, is fully transparent. You can't see it. The light just passes through it, so to speak. So air is fully transparent. See, opacity, zero. Right? Data value is zero, assuming air in this case is calibrated to zero. And then when we increase the density, the opacity also increases. So at some point we get to skin density, which is here. It's mapped to yellow, and it's semi-transparent. You, you can see it, but you can also see through it. It's like half opaque, let's say. Roughly half opaque, maybe a little bit less. And we increase the density until we hit bones. And there's a there's a value that core a data value that corresponds to bones. And bones are mapped to red, but they're also mapped to a high opacity. They're not like fully opaque, so you can still see through them a little bit, but they're a higher opacity than the skin. So you can see bones behind the skin. That's the idea. This is a layer of skin surrounding the whole, the whole thing. But because it's so so transparent, you can see through it. And then we go to the top, and we get blue, which is missing. <laughs> and that's the most dense object. And then we can see the, the teeth. Or maybe not even the whole teeth. Those might be the, just the fillings or something. <laughs> but so that's the, that's the uh, like an illustration of a transfer function. So it's mapping. In this case, it's mapping the data twice. It's mapping the data to color and opacity. That's what a transfer function does. Everybody follow me so far? Have I lost anybody? Question? What's your name again? Uh, Leo. Leo. Smart guy. Leo. Yes. So why is like why do we see the black factor is relatively transparent? Why is that not L just the line Well I guess you, you have to choose a background color, right? If you, if you're generating a graphic you have no choice. Like you have to choose some background color. So for volume, when we, whoever generated this image decided that black was a good background color, you just happened to see it. It's just a coincidence that this is black here. If this was white, we still we wouldn't see white. We would just see the background. If that makes sense. So it's just a it's just a an artifact of, of the configuration rather than an inherent property. Transfer function. Yeah. It does happen that way, though. That usually, when you see volume rendered images, the background is black. They the colors seem to stand out the best that way. This is not because yeah. white is the most opaque. Black absorbs white, white 
Yeah, yeah, the, the white would interfere with some of the other colors. It's kind of funny because just aesthetically, if in the database group I always say if you're making a video, it's nice to use a black background or slides, but if you're making a, an image for a paper, you know, a research paper, choose a white background because <laughs> it looks better like when the white background of the image matches the white of the, of the paper. Okay, so basically if you input a volume, a piece, some volume data into software and then you play around with the transfer functions, you can get lots of different results. So this is some somebody playing with a transfer function and in, in, in performing different volume renderings. This is the green color map. Right, and this is the, the red. So red is mapped to low density or low scalar values. Green is mapped to the middle, and then blue is the high. And, and we're, we're picking up mostly the low density data. And here's, here's a different image. I don't actually know what this, this data is. But we'll see more examples where I know what the data is. This is a part of assignment two, by the way. So in assignment two, some of the software you'll be using will have interfaces like this that ask you to map data, scalar values to color and opacity. And then you do it interactively, and then you see what, what, what data actually gets projected onto the screen. So it can be done interactively, even though it doesn't look like it in this slide. Here's another example of 3D volumetric data and the user changing the, the transfer function and get, getting different subsets of volume data projected onto the 2D space. Right? If you choose a very low density value, you get the outer layer of air projected onto the 2D space. So that's what I, that's what I meant when I said if you don't make any selection at all, you just project the 3D data onto the screen space, you just get a block. Just get just a block, the size of the volume and nothing else. If you want to see inside, you have to decide which subset you want to project to the 2D image plane. And you also have to decide which subset to hide or leave out, and to leave out of the, the projection process which is why you're setting the opacity to zero for a certain sub sets, sub, sub ranges. Right, so this is decreasing the opacity or moving that, that opacity threshold up and continuing to move it up along the, the data axis until you get to the most dense material or the most dense subset of the volume data. In this case, a lobster. Here's some more. Uh, here are some more examples. <clears throat> and uh, we do have some videos that show these things in action. The video we used to start off, like introduction to volume and scientific visualization. If, if I don't know if you can remember, but there was a person with a clipboard, a virtual clipboard, and they were actually changing the transfer function interactively. And sometimes you saw the head, the skin, or the bones, or different objects depending on what they were choosing. <clears throat> There's a copy of that video on YouTube, obviously, for if anybody wants to have another look. It's a great video. Any questions so far, besides the ones that are still on hold? <laughs> A queue of questions on hold. I'm going to answer them because I have slides dedicated. Them. If I didn't have any slides on, then I would just answer them right away. Okay, we'll keep going then because it is—it's a lot of 
material. It's a lot to digest. I understand this is not an easy lecture to follow. It's not easy. I think everybody here has heard the word gradient before already. Is that, that true? If you look up the word gradient in the dictionary, which I did, you get lots of different definitions. The first definition, the degree of inclination or the rate of ascent or descent in a highway, railroad, etc. Another one is the inclined surface of grade rip. In physics, the rate of change with respect to the distance of a variable quantity is temperature or pressure in the direction of maximum change. A curve representing such a rate of change. In mathematics, the differential operator operating upon a function of several variables results in a vector. The coordinates of which are partial derivatives of the function. Anybody take calculus? Anybody here? When did you take calculus? At the Open University? Yeah. yeah. A levels. That's that's on offer at the A levels. That's one of the topics. Good. The definition, interestingly enough, that we are using really is is, is three in, in this lecture. But one and three are almost the same. You could also say in this for this for data this, the degree of inclination of the rate of ascent and descent, not as in a highway, <laughs> but as in a, a set of data. That's, that could be our definition. This is a more kind of formal definition. The distance of a variable quantity, in here you just replace temperature or pressure with whatever data we happen to be looking at. A 3D, a 3D scalar field is what we're usually looking at. And this is trying to show a picture of what gradients look like. So these arrows are vector glyphs, they're gradient vector glyphs, they're going from in the increasing direction of, of gradient, so in this, color, in this case it's the color, so they're in increasing daily value or color, and pointing towards the center, and same with this, this image, the gradient is from right to left in this image, in this image the gradient is from outside to, to center. <clears throat> now gradients, why are we talking about them? Because this is kind of usually the most interesting subset of any volume data. And it's usually the most interesting subset of actually the, the world, the physical world. We're usually interested in places where things change as opposed to where they always stay the same. Right? In, in this room, we are ignoring the air that separates and that fills the room and the space that fills the room, and we're focusing on the boundaries, which are gradients. You can think of them as gradients from air to skin or whatever, soft tissue or clothing. Right? So gradients are very interesting. They usually represent boundaries. That sounds familiar, right? like isosurfaces. So <clears throat> gradients represent transition areas, right? And and we can include gradient information in our transfer functions. Or we can decide that we want to make larger gradients more opaque in our transfer functions because we can we consider them to be very important. These are two more illustrations of, of gradients. Here's a gradient vector pointing in this direction, and one pointing in here, and, and, and some more. This one's bigger. This is a bigger one because the, the transition in color is, is steeper, so to speak. Yeah. And we'll, we'll just do this one slide, and then we'll stop. This be, so we're building up, basically we're going through lots of terms, terminology, and we're building up to the ray, the 
classic frame casting and algorithm. It requires some background and some terminology before that it, before it makes sense that that algorithm. If anybody's curious, it's another kind of pipeline. <laughs> Another kind of processing pipeline. So that would be processing pipeline ish, number four ish. Uh, we like pipelines. So this is trying to illustrate the idea of a two dimensional transfer function. We already had a slide looking at a transfer function. We could retroactively call that a one dimensional transfer function because. We're only concerned in that previous slide about the data. So the data is mapped on the x-axis to color. And the data is mapped again on the y-axis to opacity. And that can be referred to or thought of as a one-dimensional transfer function. But now, we're going to map color and opacity to data and gradient magnitude. And that's what this diagram, or these diagrams, these are the, these are the same diagrams, by the way. This, they're trying to be the same. This is from the original research paper, like copied and pasted. This is like somebody trying to draw and recreate that diagram in PowerPoint to make it a little bit clearer. It is not, it's a non-trivial to, to understand. <clears throat> Now along this axis, we could call it the x-axis if we want, is the scalar value or the data value, right? And that could be mapped to color. Along the y-axis is opacity, but there's another axis, the gradient magnitude axis. So here, the gradient magnitude is zero, and, and up here, the gradient magnitude is the maximum gradient magnitude, the maximum derivative or the maximum amount of change inside the data set. And what's happening is the opacity, so this, is, this whole axis is zero gradient magnitude, right? Because gradient magnitude is mapped to the to the z-axis in this particular diagram. And what happens is opacity, this is like a tent, opacity starts at zero and it's increasing, it's moving upwards. It's hard to see, but like it's moving upwards. So these two are moving upwards together. And a little interactive. <laughs> diagram illustration. So as the gradient magnitude increases, opacity also increases. That's what that, that diagram is trying to show. And that means we can see that the things that are most visible have the, have the highest opacity and coincide, coincide with the highest gradient magnitude which means we're focusing on the boundaries. Any boundary objects inside the volume are characterized by high gradients. So this transfer function is specifically designed to pick up the high gradients which correspond to boundaries in the volume automatically, like in an automatic way. That's, that's what the illustration is about. Capacity is a function of scalar value and local gradient. The greater the gradient magnitude, the higher the opacity, right? And it highlights the transition areas. And it, it dampens or it sets the uniform areas to zero opacity, so we can't see them anymore. That's the idea. What should that data represent? Which data? This, this is, this could be any data. This is any 3D, it is a very confusing graph, yes. So this axis is the, this is basically, the thing of this is the data value, 
right, along this axis. And you could also think of color. Color is wrapped to data value too. I think the images in this particular paper are black and white, so color is not so important. But usually, usually the data value is wrapped to color, right? but the data value in this case is also mapped to well, the gradient. I'm sorry, the gradient magnitude is also mapped to opacity. It is confusing. There's no question about it. It's it's confusing. So that's why it's called a 2D transfer function. Um, imagine we wanted to get back to the 1D transfer function from here. We should be able to do that. Um, you know, it's, it's okay if you don't understand that. We should be able to do that using dimension reduction, going from 2D to 1D. So let's do a, an imaginary dimension reduction. Just just leave out the, the whole z dimension of this illustration, and you get these two axes. Those are the same two axes as the 1D transfer function from a few slides ago. These two. Opacity being mapped to data value, and, and color being mapped to data value from two, however many slides ago that was. The, the first transfer function slide. Now we're adding a second dimension into the transfer function that is gradient magnitude. So instead of just mapping opacity to data value, it's mapping it to, to gradient magnitude, which is increasing as we go up. Yeah, it, it's confusing. The diagrams could be better. I mean, actually, what we would like to do is we'd like to take this diagram and be able to rotate it around to see it from different viewpoints. Because we're trying to look at a 3D structure to be to be space. Yeah. Okay, now that everybody's thoroughly confused, I think that's a good time to stop. Probably. And we're going to then look into the this sound of Monday. Have a good weekend. Thank you.